Welcome to Reframed, a podcast created to educate, encourage, and inspire parents and professionals. The research is clear. Parenting a child that has a history of loss, abuse, neglect, or trauma requires parenting skills and insight to be reframed. We partner with child welfare experts to bring you evidence-based and research-driven information. Reframed host, Emily Moorhead, LPC, and guests strive to make an impact on our world by creating conversations about topics that are important to you, your family, and our communities. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Reframed. I'm your host, Emily Moorhead, and today I'm joined with my colleague, Heather Rogers. Heather, tell us about yourself. Hi, my name's Heather Rogers. I am a licensed professional counselor in the state of Texas. I have been at Gladney for 14 years, and I currently supervise the Gladney Home. Um, that's our program where we house teenage girls in foster care who are ready and hoping for adoption with an adoptive family. So Heather, you and I, actually fun fact of the podcast, are friends in real life. And so I know that you are a mom to a toddler. And when you took this position in the Gladney home as they started the program, you became a mom to teenage girls. I'm guessing parenting looks a little bit different for you. You know, I always wanted a girl and and I've had about six teenage girls over the course of the past year. And yes, in some ways, parenting teenage girls is very different. And in other ways, it's very similar to parenting uh, my toddler. So yeah, it was a quick jump. (laughs) I bet. Well, I was hoping today you could talk to us a little bit about connecting with teenagers. Specifically, you are running a program that's taking care of teen girls who have been in the foster care system for a long time. Some of the files actually, you know, have been the girls been in the system their entire lives. Um, And so I was hoping you could kind of talk with parents about how to connect with a child who may come with a trauma background. What does that look like? Well, I want to say that um, connection is one of the most important things, um, but it's also really, really hard. It can be really hard sometimes. Um, And so first, if you are bringing a a child or um, a teenager in your home and they have a background um, of trauma, which let's just be honest, if, if they're coming from the foster care system, they have, they have a traumatic background in some way or another. Um, first, you're just going to have to work on your patients. I mean, there, there will be days that are up and down. Some days you will feel like you are just rocking it. And other days you will feel like a total fail failure And I think that's really normal, but I also think that giving yourself patience and grace um, is a really important part of this process. Um, But different ways to connect. So connecting with a teenager can look so different than having to connect with a younger child. Um, It's it's easier to connect with a toddler in a lot of ways. Let's color, let's paint, let's read a story, come crawl in my lap. Those are things that we talk about doing with younger kids that probably aren't happening when you're when you're with a, an older child or at least not not at first. So um, some pointers I would say are find out what kind of music they're into, find out what kind of things they like to do for fun, or create opportunities where they can learn that. Some of these kids may not know what they like to do for fun because they might have not ever had an opportunity to be on a basketball team or play soccer or take a dance class, um, things like that. Um, Another thing that you can do is just create opportunity for connection. So um, if you find out what their favorite TV show is or what kind of shows or movies they like to to watch, you know, build that into your daily life. Also, I would suggest um, starting to create some traditions together. So Friday night pizza night, you know, Saturday afternoon movies as a family, Um, emphasizing the importance of, you know, sitting together as a family once a day, whether that's breakfast or dinner, um, whatever your schedule allows, you know, the important things with teenagers is getting that face time because they're already in a situation where they're trying to figure out their independence, they're growing up. Um, and a lot of the kiddos that we're working with who are teenagers and have come from trauma have probably had to fend for themselves a lot. So they might come across as very independent. Um, They can probably do their own laundry. They can probably, um, you know, 
take care of themselves as far as, you know, hygiene and bathing and things like that. Um, but they may not have had the opportunity to have someone read them a story or um, have someone brush their hair or braid it, things like that. So just creating those opportunities and looking for those opportunities where you can create that connection. It might be tiny, but those tiny little consistent connections will build up to really big, big strides in the long run. So Heather, I think whether we want to acknowledge it or not, when we become parents, we kind of have these preconceived notions of what fun things we're going to do with our kids or what their hobbies or activities are going to be. So how do you teach parents to lean into what their child's interests are and not what their own is? One of the things that I'll just be really transparent that we experienced in the Gladney home is that, you know, we had these girls moving in with us and we want them to have the world. I mean, plus Gladney has so many wonderful friends and supporters that we were getting, you know, clothes and just fun, girly things to be able to do. And we like to show love by showering them with gifts and things. And um, it became apparent pretty quickly that that really wasn't the way to build connection. Um, And in some ways that set us back a few steps. Um, So I would fight the urge. I'm not saying don't give them gifts or things or or fun things like that, but fight the urge to do so much at once. It can feel really overwhelming to a kiddo that hasn't experienced that before. Um, And also just lower your expectations because I can tell you from experience that you are going to plan, have this great idea of what, um, you know, your fun pool party is going to look like, or, you know, family game night And it's not going to go how you expected it. And that's okay. Um, But you've got to lower that expectation and just pick yourself back up and try again um, and be consistent. If I could say anything, especially with teenagers, it is so important to be consistent with them. Um, They need to know that if they've come into your home and you've adopted them, you've adopted them, you're there and you will continue to show up for them. Um, one thing that's been really important for us to remember in the Gladney home and for me specifically is that I know that I'm a safe person and I know that I have their best intentions at my, at heart and my staff does. Um, but they have no reason to know that and they have no reason to believe that every adult in their life that was supposed to be there for them has failed them. And even since they've been in the CPS system, you know, unfortunately, Sometimes they've been failed by those professionals as well. So really, I'm just another adult with the words coming out of myself, my mouth, that um, they have no reason to believe what I'm saying or to think that I'm going to be there for them long term or to think I'm going to follow through. So lower your expectations. Be consistent. If something doesn't go well, try it again. Um, I think, you know... I'll give an example. Friday night pizza night, we just decided, hey, you know what? Families do this. We're going to have Friday night pizza night in the home. And so we just decided every Friday night we order pizza. Um, So for the first few weeks, it was uh, pizza again. We had pizza last week. Da, da, da. And now, you know, four months into every Friday night pizza night, it's we're having pizza night, right? When's the pizza going to be here? Did you order my favorite pizza? Da, da, da. And so, you know, that has become something that they know that they can expect every Friday night. It's tradition. This is what we do. Um, and that's just a small example, but I think it's a really important one to show that um, consistency pays off. I think when we talk about connecting with teens, it's important that we talk about the real issue of having boundaries while staying connected, especially because I love what you said about they don't trust us fully. Um, And so we have to help them feel safe. Um, But sometimes helping them feel safe is having boundaries and rules. So how do we walk that line? Yeah, I think that the boundaries are really important in creating felt safety. So um, in your home, I think it's important right off the bat to set the rules and be really clear and communicate what those rules and expectations are. So maybe it's that, you know, we don't, we don't cuss in our home or, um, you know, 
we have dinner as a family five nights a week. Whatever that expectation is, it needs to be clearly communicated. Um, it's it's really easy to think that things make sense because it's something that we've always done or that makes sense to us. And understanding that that may not have been the world that they lived in, or it may be something that's completely foreign to our teen um, when they come into our home is is just something to keep in the forefront of our mind. Um, but just creating healthy boundaries. So, um, you know, I think the language thing is something that's important. So, you know, our teens have a lot of colorful language and they use it quite freely. Um, we pick our battles on that, but we do draw the line. It's not okay to aggressively call someone a foul name or to cuss at someone. So if they stub their toe and they let a word slip, you know what? We've got bigger battles to pick than that. But if they are talking to an adult and they start um, getting frustrated and calling names, then it's really important that we put a stop to that right then. And we say, hey, I hear that you're frustrated and I want to help you, but it's not okay for you to talk to me like that. So let's try this again with kinder words. Um, And sometimes it feels like you might be talking to a younger child. It's also important to remember that a teen that's been through trauma might be as young as half of their chronological age. So you might have a 16 year year old in your home and really they might actually be on a maturity level of an eight year old Um, or when they get scared or triggered, that might be what they revert to is, is an eight-year-old maturity. And so we have to remember that sometimes it's those quick, firm words that we need to use if they are crossing a boundary. How do we avoid lecturing or um, kind of nagging? I know that, you know, when a teen does open up, sometimes it's things that we don't honestly want to hear. Like sometimes they're behaviors that not so great. Um, so how do we listen while avoiding what our gut is doing and and trying to kind of shut that behavior down? This is a great question. Um, So I love to talk, if you haven't noticed already from this podcast, but um, one of the things that's really important to remember, especially when talking to teens, is, you know, as few words as possible, especially if it's kind of um, correcting a behavior or in a moment of frustration where they are triggered or they are dysregulated, not using a lot of words. Also, we haven't, most of us haven't had the life experiences that they have had. Um, and their 15 year old, 17 year old selves, they have experienced more life and more difficult things than some of us will ever be able to imagine or understand. And so If they start talking to us about sex, for example, and we want to go into a lecture about why, you know, I'm just picking something out of the air, but why they should wait until they find the right person. And they've already had, you know, all of these different sexual experiences that they're just going to shut us off in their mind. So I think you're right. Sometimes listening to them and just letting them talk while our internal self is maybe having like some alarms going off saying, oh my gosh, what am I hearing? Ah, what do I say? Um, sometimes saying nothing is okay. Or sometimes letting them share and then saying, wow, thank you so much for trusting me enough to tell me that. Or I'm really thankful that you're opening up to me. It's also okay to say, I don't know. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that Um, I get asked a lot of questions by teenage girls um, many days of the week. And when I waver and say, oh, I don't know, I have to think about it. A lot of times they hear yes. Um, So I have to say sometimes I can't answer that question right now. I'm not I, I need to think about it. So I can't answer that right now. I'll give let's talk about it another day instead of like, well, maybe I think so we could and not just giving them a firm no. And sometimes a firm no is a safer answer than a maybe for them because that unknown is, can be really scary. Heather, earlier you used the term felt safety. Can you kind of walk me through the definition of that? Yes. So felt safety is when a child that comes to us from a trauma background and has a history of trauma begins to feel safe. And when they start to feel safe, they are able to begin healing from that trauma. Um, Felt safety is 
something that disarms the brain from their fight, flight, or freeze mode. And so then allows that child to be able to start growing and learning and having other experiences other than feeling um, like they are in a constant state of the unknown or or chaos or trauma. I know that we hear that term a lot of times um, with the TBRI community, um, Dr. Cross and Dr. Karen Purvis. And um, a lot of the trainings that we do at Gladney for our families who are adopting, you know, utilize that curriculum and, and that background. If a family um, is adopting a child who might have some mental health risk factors, um, trauma history, foster care, like obviously they're going to need some mental health care. So what tips do you have for families um, to make sure that they're getting the right care um, and to make sure that their child is being advocated for? So I think it's important to make sure that um, when a child comes into your home, um, likely they'll be on some medications And although it's okay to evaluate those medications and see if they're really the best fit, I think making any sudden changes can be difficult. So maybe letting, um, letting that adjustment of them coming to your home happen first before you make any sudden changes is important. I think it's always really beneficial and important to continue or begin counseling, um, these, children have been through so much trauma and so much hardship that um, as they do begin to feel safe in your home, um, they also may start to vocalize or verbalize some of the hurts that they've experienced. And we want them to have a safe, productive way to um, to share those and have therapeutic help to get through those um, those experiences and those the, the way that they're processing it. So counseling is important. Medication is important. Um, you know, having a, a psychiatrist that can help monitor those meds is important. Um, you know, you might need to look into family counseling or counseling m- with your spouse because adding a child to your home um, can be really challenging and difficult. I think it's important to acknowledge the honeymoon stage. Um, that's something that you might hear about and, um, People ask, how long does the honeymoon stage last? And there's, I wish there was a, you know, straight answer for that, but there's not. It could last a week. It could last, you know, five months. Um, It might be a really drastic change and there may not be a drastic change at all, but it is important to acknowledge that you may be a month in and start seeing after that month some really challenging behaviors. Um, That's really normal. And it's important to acknowledge that it's hard, but it's also important to acknowledge that it's normal. Um, It could be this child saying, okay, I've started to feel safe and comfortable. Oh my gosh, what do I do with this feeling and experience? They're never going to want to keep me forever. What can I do to push them away? Um, it might be, how much can I get away with? I've, I've, now I understand my surroundings. I'm in this, I've been in this environment for a while. Um, let me see what pushing the boundaries looks like. Um, it's just important to recognize that that is something that may happen and to be prepared for it. Um, cause if you're not, it can come out of the blue and, and feel really disruptive. Heather, I think that any person parenting a teenager probably just needs a little bit of hope. Um, can you share, with families hope story or a time that you felt like, man, I did this moment right. Um, maybe I messed up the whole day, but this moment was good. So on a week where we were just needing to get out of the house and having a really challenging time, um, you know, we had a stockpile of silly string in our storage closet and we just decided let's pile everyone in the van and we're going to take all of our silly string and we're going to drive around to different um, Gladney staff members houses and surprise them with a little silly string attack. Um, So with several teenage girls, you can imagine, you know, some thought this was so fun and the coolest thing ever. And some, rolled their eyes and said it was going to be lame. Um, And honestly, in my heart and soul, I thought this could be so fun. And also this could really just totally tank. And I hope it doesn't. Um, 
But, you know, it was so fun. And we did go. And I will tell you, again, lowering the expectations because myself and one of the girls were the one who silly stringed people. Um, and not everyone participated in actually spraying. But I will tell you, there were smiles on everyone's face. There were giggles. It was silly. It was playful. Um, and I call it a win. You know, if I had set my expectation up to where all of the girls had silly string and they all participated, then I would have been really let down. But I just said, you know what? You do this experience in the way that best suits each of your personalities. Um, and that allowed it to to work. You know, we had one girl playing DJ and one girl just laughing at all of us being silly and one just, you know, have that silly string bottle ready to go. So um, I think that's a great example of one, a win. I called that a win. I rode on that high for, you know, a week. But two, just adapting to, okay, you know what? We need to change the scenery. We need to get out. Let's go do something. It may work. It may not. Um, But being able to be silly and fun and spontaneous, especially with teens, is so important. Um, If you're familiar with TBRI, then you'll be familiar with being playful. Um, And again, playful is something that's really easy to do with a three-year-old or a five-year-old, but it's harder to translate that into a teenager. And so sometimes we have to get really creative and sometimes it looks different than it might for a younger child. And so um, spontaneity can be a really great way to be playful with teens. That is an adorable story. I'm having like a mental image of that car just pulling up and all the shenanigans. Um, but I love it. It's it's being in the moment. It's dropping our expectations as parents and just trying to be with them um, and hoping that we can be playful and connected. And when we mess it up, trying again. I love that. Heather, I'm so grateful that you have shared your experience with us and, and your fun stories. Um, some positive and some fails. <laughs> um, I appreciate you so much and the work of the Gladney Home. We will link resources to caring for teens in your show notes, so check them out. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Reframed. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Reframed. Visit GladneyUniversity.org to access the show notes and learn about upcoming trainings at Gladney University. We'd love your feedback, so please rate, review, and subscribe. Until next time.